Hi all, thank you for joining uh, this presentation on affordable housing for justice involved people um, by the NYU Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Um, today we're gonna get started actually with some policy updates from Enterprises End. So Atsarama Swami, if you wanna take it away. Yeah, thanks Brittany for that introduction. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar on the call. My name is Atsa Ramaswamy. Um, I'm a policy fellow with Enterprise, um, but I also straddle over and help out with the sort of programmatic work as well um, when it comes to justice involved housing um, in the New York office. Um, so given the kind of current climate, of course, um, and the really real implications that we're seeing of the pandemic on um, justice involved New Yorkers and people all across the country, uh, we've been really, uh, really focusing a lot of our policy efforts towards the immediate needs and concerns of justice involved people. Um, so on the policy front, we've been kind of engaged with two, two major priorities. Uh, the first has been happening since, since the fall, really, um, and it was an interest in um, pursuing policy work to uh, expand state and local protections for arrest and conviction records in housing. Um, this is part of a fair housing package of priorities that we've put together um, and we're excited to launch a campaign with employment advocates for a sort of joint um, advocacy campaign. Um, however, this was um, kind of our, our initial focus and it slightly shifted with news of the pandemic. Um, so, uh, you know, early March, we quickly reconvened um, a steering committee that we have uh, that a number of you are on, of course, um, that kind of discusses the needs of justice involved people and, and their housing needs. And we were really concerned by the huge outbreak numbers at jails and prisons, um, especially in New York City, you know, we're seeing up to 10% infection rates um, for people at Rikers with reports that even likely half of them have been exposed, um, but are currently asymptomatic. Um, so while we were really glad, we were really happy to see that the city took immediate steps to release um, people. So, so far about 1500 people have been released. Those are people who are over 60, people with existing health conditions on plea trial. Um, and, and we're excited by these quick steps, but they were unfortunately really just not coupled with the adequate uh, emergency housing access and so many other resources that people need for successful reentry, um, which the Capstones team will we'll discuss today, things like health services, employment services. Um, so we've put together a letter to the mayor and a couple of other city agencies um, asking for immediate emergency housing access and uh, you know, supporting the release of these people. Um, and we're also looking at putting together a letter for public housing authorities um, as another way to address this, this housing need. Um, these are of course, emergency solutions that we're needing immediately, but we're also really interested in um, really focused on the permanent and long lasting implications that coronavirus is only really adding to. Um, and these housing needs are really what's addressed in this presentation today. Um, and some of the really great examples and models that we should be pursuing um, um, will be highlighted. Thanks, that's that. Um, so as many of you know, this presentation is a part of Enterprise New York's two-pronged justice-involved housing initiative. The first prong being an education curriculum that we are developing in partnership with several of um, our justice-involved providers. So Vera Institute of Justice, the Fortune Society, the Fair Housing Justice Center, and LISC are all in partnership on this education curriculum. Um, and we're really creating this curriculum in order to share with affordable housing owners and operators who are looking to build justice involved housing or who happen to house justice involved people um, from the community. So this education curriculum is going to contain anti-discrimination policies, um, is gonna provide TA and is hopefully also gonna reduce stigma for this population. And so the second prong of the New York office's justice involved housing initiative is a housing model focus, which the Capstone team has been working on uh, for the past academic year. And they have interviewed a number of our partners in order to gauge housing and service needs for justice involved people in attempts to create housing models that can fit those needs. So that's what we're gonna be looking at today. And this is especially important now, given what us shared about early release 
many folks are exiting incarceration and are in need of housing. So these best practices and lessons learned um, could be put into practice to serve the reentry population. We really appreciate the collaborative effort that the team has put into this project and hope that this is as beneficial to you all as it has been for us. And just some logistical things before we get started, there will be a Q&A portion after the presentation. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please post them in the chat box and I will moderate uh, the, the panel at the end. So Chiweta, if you wanna get started. Great, um, thank you Utsa and Brittany for that introduction. Hello everyone, my name is Chiweta and I am here with Jalen, Sam, and Eleni as the NYU Capstone team who has been working with Enterprise throughout this school year. And as you've heard, we are focusing on affordable housing for justice involved people. And before we begin, we just want to say how excited we are to present our findings and how we truly appreciate you all being here with us today, especially during this time. Um, we will hopefully be able to answer any of your questions um, at the end of this presentation. So let's get started. Here, we have an agenda for our presentation today. We'll first be going over the project scope then heading over to our research questions that guided our overall project, then to our key findings, and lastly, going over our recommendations and three housing models that were created based on our findings and overall research. And all of our steps during this process will come together in a final report that will be distributed to you all. The report will include background information and a deeper analysis of what we will present to you today. Um, and in the final slides of this presentation, which will also be circulated, you will find sample case studies used to help build our housing models. Now, before we dive in, we quickly wanted to highlight these statistics. One in five people leaving Rikers and one in two people leaving state prisons enter the New York City shelter system. Um, we saw this as important to note in order to bring to light why we're even focusing on affordable housing for this population. And as many of us know, New York City already has a shortage of affordable housing in general. Um, and what we'll discuss later is about the barriers to reentry that the justice involved population face. And according to the Prison Policy Institute, formerly incarcerated people are 10 times more likely to be homeless than the general population. And with that, we have our project scope. So in order to support enterprise in bridging the gap between housing providers and justice involved individuals, we conducted a literature review and interviewed social service providers and mission oriented housing developers to identify the greatest barriers to housing that justice involved people face, the services most important to facilitating successful reentry. Um, finding the appropriate measures of success for affordable housing providers, and lastly, identifying the best practices for financing development of affordable housing with supportive services. And now we have our research questions um, that guided our overall project. And with these questions, we were looking to find the top challenges to reentry for the justice involved population, looking at the challenges that housing providers face to successfully house these individuals, and lastly, looking to find best practices for providing affordable housing and how these practices address the challenges identified above. And with that, I will pass this over to Jalen, who will go deeper into our key findings. Great. Thanks, Chuetta. Um, So for our key findings, we're going to be organizing this into four main areas. Uh, so the first, I will talk a bit about the barriers that justice involved people face when um, seeking affordable housing. Um, I'll also be speaking about some of the services needed to best support um, a successful reentry process. Then I'll be passing it over to my colleague Sam to speak a bit about um, the best measures for assessing the success of these services that are being provided in the in affordable housing models and also to talk a bit about best practices for financing the development of these um, housing developments. So first, uh, to speak a bit about the barriers that justice involved folks can face when seeking affordable housing. Um, when discussing barriers to affordable housing, first, 
I think it's important to name the existing systemic factors that have, that have contributed to these challenges, um, which of course in New York City are going to include redlining. So the consequences of redlining really persist to the present day, um, including segregating neighborhoods, draining resources from and preventing real estate equity ownership for communities of color, as well as um, addressing community issues. Um, redlining is directly tied to the inaccessibility of housing, insufficient community investment, and ultimately increases in crime for communities of color. So we think it's important when talking about the barriers that justice involved folks may face in seeking housing, it's really important to name that there are an existing set of factors sort of beyond um, the scope of their personal experience that really play a, a significant role here. Um, so through our research and our literature review, it's clear that there is insufficient affordable housing in New York City, especially considering what's available for the justice involved. Um, so in 2017, nearly 2.8 million homes, um, including um, nearly half of all apartments, were over the affordability threshold, and half of this group um, were considered severely rent burdened. Um, so considering New York City's high cost of living, the growing population and rapid gentrification, um, which contributes to rising rents, there's a large gap in affordable housing, um, particularly for those with criminal histories. Um, so in our conversations with service providers, um, developers, and even tenants, um, we've learned that while the demand certainly exists, the supply um, just isn't high enough to meet um, the need um, due to high development costs and additional um, limited resources. So through our convert, oops, sorry, go back to the, thank you. Um, so in terms of the sort of specific barriers that were identified by our partners as being the sort of biggest challenges folks are facing, um, violent crime convictions were one of the pieces named by our partners um, in addition to the credit checks that are imposed as being severely limiting to the justice involved when seeking um, support with affordable housing. Um, and in addition, the stigma that can be associated with being justice involved um, and cultural and racial barriers that exist um, can often limit the choices that folks have. It's important to note um, that while the justice involved do face a number of challenges in finding affordable housing, policymakers are actively working to reduce this burden. Um, so New York City Council Speaker Corey Johnson has made a number of recommendations to support reentry for this population um, in support of existing policy initiatives that are also working to address this issue, including NYCHA's Family Reentry Pilot Program. And then we um, did some research into services. So really wanting to know what the most supportive services would be uh, to support the reentry process. Um, over the course of our research and in conversation with partners, um, we learned that um, as folks are seeking to model their housing and service offerings, um, folks are gonna find pretty limited guidance um, in the existing program literature. There isn't a one size fits all model that's really going to be uh, the best fit for all involved. Um, it really, based on our research, it appears that it's really dependent upon the individual and what specific services they need um, that are unique to their um, individual circumstance. We did find that overall employment services do tend to be um, so some of the most helpful. Um, and in addition, um, health services, including mental health and drug counseling services are also um, important and educational services may be helpful as well. And I'll pass it to my colleague, Sam, uh, to talk a bit about uh, measurement and financing. Thank you, Jalen. Um, so when we were really looking at uh, how do we best measure success for the affordable housing, uh, specifically for the justice involved population, we came up with these six uh, in our research and our conversations with providers, developers. Um, and so one that we wanted to highlight was recidivism uh, often comes up uh, especially in this field. However, when we, we spoke to a few, uh, a few partners, they highlighted how this could be problematic if um, the, the variable is inconsistent, it might leave out those entering the shelter system and really just focus on those re-entering the criminal justice system. So we wanted to point that out. Additionally, we wanted to highlight that uh, multiple indicators of success are, are typically outweigh one. Um, two that we wanted to highlight in particular, um, we're applying a racial equity lens and generational advancement. Um, these were two more of the progressive measures uh, when we were thinking about success for, for this population. For racial equity, 
Um, given the system of mass incarceration uh, and the targeting of black and brown uh, individuals, racial equity is key in making sure that we are paying extra attention um, to the outcomes of black and brown people. And this was highlighted uh, by multiple partners that we spoke to and in research as well. Uh, so we wanted to highlight that. We also wanted to highlight uh, the generational advancement measure. And so really this is looking at not only the success and the outcomes of the individuals in the housing, but um, what about looking at their children? What about looking at their family members that they support and also trying to measure these outcomes? Of course, this comes with cost and time and extra resources, but you know, given, given that possibility, this seems like a really uh, key and progressive measure. In terms of key findings for best practices for um, actual affordable housing development, these were some that we came up with, uh, again, through our conversations and our research. Number one, uh, Jalen touched on employment and how key that is as a, as a service and how this goes kind of hand in hand with, uh, with affordable housing. But establishing workforce was really key. It came up over and over again. Um, and uh, we wanted to highlight one uh, organization who um, is bringing in a local entrepreneurship organization uh, as a partner and providing uh, employment training and entrepreneurship training in their uh, building, making uh, services even more accessible. And so employment can look a number of different ways and we'll get to that more um, as one of our recommendations as well. Number two, um, really being innovative with funding. And so this is kind of just by nature of the field, um, affordable housing, generally speaking, but just from talking with developers and providers, um, there's so much fragmented funding. Um, one, one partner called this putting, piecing together a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and so this, you know, we've heard anywhere from seven to 15 to who knows how many streams, 20 streams even, uh, funding streams. And this could look anywhere from uh, credits, light tech uh, being one of the, uh, you know, the, the national kind of standard for, for a housing credit for affordable housing. Um, loans were, were crucial. Uh, this came, these could be loans we saw from uh, HPD, from uh, the state, uh, and from uh, private bank loans as well were, were very key for developers who we spoke to who needed extra support in funding uh, throughout the year and reimbursing service providers um, and just having funds on, on hand. Um, 1515, JISH, so the uh, Justice Involved Supporting Housing, uh, RFP came up a bunch. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about funding restrictions as well. Uh, HRA funding for seniors. Um, we also wanted to highlight philanthropic uh, partnerships and, uh, and the, the ability for philanthropy to play a key role in the funding of affordable housing and how there might be less tied, less strings attached um, or less restrictions than maybe like a publicly funded stream. Um, JISH specifically um, fills in a lot of the holes that 1515 and Ishai um, might lack in terms of for those who aren't chronically homeless. And this really takes a lot of timing and planning, which we'll get to as well. Number three, um, collaborating with service providers. And collaboration uh, was key, uh, especially for developers, and really making sure to uh, partner with those who are more, maybe more experienced, more knowledgeable, um, and just more versed and competent in providing adequate services for the justice involved population. Um, there's, there's a development, uh, a de one developer worked with an organization who hires um, justice involved folks themselves. And so clearly uh, services are gonna be coming more naturally from this kind of partnership, um, more culturally competent, Etc. So collaboration uh, came up repeatedly. Number four, um, making these services flexible, and, and what we really mean is client-centered approaches. Um, and so again, Jalen highlighted the different needs of services, but making these services flexible uh, came up again and again. And lastly, uh, cultivating relationships with communities. Uh, this is an, another one of our, our featured recommendations as well, but really when developers and providers can work well with, with, with the local community and work to have the development work, not just for themselves, but also for the community, uh, we've seen success. 
And so we wanted to highlight that as well. Um, one quote that we thought did a nice job of summing up this collaboration component, um, let's not force developers into being service providers and vice versa, and just highlighting the fact that, um, you know, working with each other, working with providers and developers, um, and those who, you know, maybe provide strengths where, where we lack. And so we thought this was a nice quote that we wanted to highlight. So uh, this brings us to our recommendations which uh, we came up with based off of our research. Um, and we pieced those recommendations basically for three different types of audiences, um, even though there might be some overlap in between. But the first bucket of recommendations has to do with action steps for service providers. And so these, these recommendations revolve around the degree of service requirements, when to deliver those services, um, and, and general awareness around housing, um, and what to include. And so this can look a lot like can in working in conjunction with city agencies here as well. So not just for service providers, but actually trying to access uh, justice involved individuals even before they leave the criminal justice system. Um, for developers, number two, uh, planning and funding, uh, considering tenants perspectives and collaboration were key in our recommendations. Um, and we'll highlight a few of those as well in a second. Um, number three, just other action steps for agencies, uh, policy organizations, um, and, and other players in the affordable housing field um, that maybe aren't a provider or a developer. And so these revolve around um, continuing on the work that many organizations in this field have been doing, but develop, uh, making a developer listing can be helpful for, for service providers to see who is uh, available and who's, who has done successful work in this field already um, or who's trying to get into this field. Um, and uh, another one we wanted to highlight was the protected class. Um, and so uh, Enterprise as well as other partners have already started working on this, um, but really trying to advocate for a justice involved protected class in housing was a key recommendation. Uh, we wanna focus on three recommendations in particular uh, just to go in a little more in depth. The first being providing choice of services. And so this revolves again around a client centered approach, um, really trying to not limit, um, but better engage uh, and better implement services when individuals have more agency in determining the, the level of services and what services they actually need. No, no justice involved individual looks the same. And so really trying to meet uh, individuals where their needs are. Um, the second we wanted to highlight was uh, plan first, fund second. And so um, while this is pretty straightforward, uh, development takes a ton of time. Um, developers who we talk to have to consider so many different um, factors when they're trying to map out funding. And so rather than jumping to what funds you need first, um, we recommend really looking at what, try to, what kind of development are you trying to build? Um, what type of land are you using? Is this a public, acquisi uh, public acquisition that might require ULERP uh, or other, other processes? Um, what AMI are you looking for and what AMI might be determined based off of the, the credits and the funding streams that you're using? What percent set aside are you going to consider if you are considering for justice involved? And we talked to developers um, and we'll highlight a few who have put set-asides in just for justice-involved people, um, on-site services, things like this. And so these kinds of questions determine the amount and the types of funding. Um, and we also provide in our report that we will be sharing out, um, but just uh, the John Jay and Fortune Society's NIMBY uh, resource, not in my backyard, can, help, uh, can be very helpful with working with the community and the Supportive Housing Network uh, of New York has put together a nice funding guide that um, can be really helpful in getting a sense of the funding streams, applications, uh, and goes way more in depth than, uh, than we can. Number three, collaboration. We've already hit this a little bit, but basically better, we found better service delivery, better community engagement when uh, developers were collaborating locally. Um, and uh, one example of this that we thought was a great representation of why this is so key was one developer who was working um, and got a lot of um, community board feedback and criticism um, and pushback 
to actually developing in their neighborhood. Um, the developer really collaborated with community, with uh, community board, with the community board, um, local uh, government officials, um, community members, community leaders, and um, through time actually developed a partnership and created space in the building, not just for tenants, but for partnership and bringing in the community board. Now the community board actually has meetings in that space. And so we thought this was a really nice way of how can we think about when we're, we are developing, especially when development tends to happen in lower income communities of color, how do we make sure that these developments are um, accessible and that they are working with the community and not against the community? Um, and shared space was a really nice example of that. So that's a little bit about our recommendations. We could definitely go more into some of them if we have time in Q&A, but I'm gonna pass it on to Eleni, uh, who's gonna speak more about our housing models that we came up with. Thanks, Sam. Um, I'm going to introduce three ideal housing models for affordable housing for justice-involved people. Um, now, each is ideal for a different sub subpopulation of justice-involved people, and each is targeted at a differently situated developer. So the first model assumes ample resources to meet tenant service needs, while the last, the third, requires the least resources to house justice-involved tenants. Um, the three models are defined along five lines the services that are provided to tenants, um, what it takes to get into the building as a justice involved person, the requirements for staying in the building, who's expected to live there, and how developers might get money to put together this kind of development. Um, and lastly, we provide an inspiration that uh, an existing housing development that got us towards the model. The first model uh, we call individualized services and its hallmarks are being full service with individually tailored service menus for justice involved tenants. Um, model one is essentially supportive housing. So tenants get ample support with services that meet their individual needs. You might see employment services, mental health treatment, substance abuse treatment, health services, legal services, benefits referral, family services, um, even extras like gardening courses. Um, because model one makes this strong effort to meet needs, services are um you know services are provided on site or by referral with intensive case management on site um this kind of housing is appropriate for justice involved tenants with significant and long-term needs that benefit from a higher level of services uh and so from an admissions perspective a strong effort is made not to turn away any prospective tenants who can benefit from the housing um because there is such a significant outlay of resources to put this model together, there are uh, consequently significant requirements to actually stay in the building. Um, and so you might have to meet drug testing requirements. Uh, we've said earlier, Sam has said earlier, that we don't want to force people into services, but once a tenant agrees to partake of certain services, we might require that the individual continue to partake of those services. Um, and again, because there are so many resources, resources marshaled in one place to be resource efficient, we expect that model one housing will have a high concentration of justice involved tenants. Um, as possible funding streams, we imagine that developers might make use of New York State mortgages, LIHTC, supportive housing loan program, and the New York City Mayor's funding. The inspiration for this kind of, oh, I'm still on slide one. Um, the inspiration for this model is the Fortune Society's Castle Gardens. It's supportive and affordable housing um, in a mixed setting. It provides on-site individualized services and 63 of the 113 units in Castle Gardens is reserved for justice involved individuals. Um, one of our Fortune Society interviewees told us, we provide wraparound services because different people have different needs. Um, the next model we call targeted population. It's similar to the first, but it's limited to a targeted population. Um, and so it's affordable housing that's, that follows the supportive housing model, but only for a specific population, seniors, individuals with substance abuse needs, um, and it focuses on meeting the top needs of that population. So for the sake of resource efficiency, this model only asks developers to focus on the vital needs of the target population rather than catering to the full range of needs that uh, model one might um, cater to. 
uh, as a consequence, we have selective admissions to ensure that individuals needs can actually be met by the program. So you have to be a member of the target population. Um, and thereafter, we need to ensure that tenants needs can be met by the program's offerings and uh, admissions are decided accordingly. What we have in mind here, and this overlaps with the criteria to maintain tenancy, the requirements to maintain tenancy, is that um, we need to know that tenants can actually successfully live in this kind of housing. So you could imagine affordable housing for seniors um, being appropriate up until the point where an individual's healthcare needs become too great to be accommodated in that building. Uh, insofar as who lives there, 100% of tenants are members of the target population, whether that be, for example, seniors or individuals with substance abuse issues. And we imagine, again, a high concentration of justice-involved individuals just because there are so many resources marshaled in one place. Um, possible funding streams include, again, LIHTC, um, ESHI, New York City 1515, HFA mortgages, and HPD funding. And our case study here, Inspiration, is 1080 Washington, an upcoming affordable housing development for senior citizens. Provides on-site services for this target population through a partnership between Bronx Pro, the developer, and the Fortune Society, the service provider. Um, and it's expected that 30% of 1080 Washington's 154 units will be set aside for justice-involved seniors. Lastly, um, we have affordable housing without discrimination. So one thing we heard from a member from one of our interviews is that some people just need a place to, leave, to lay their heads, not these extra services. Um, for some people, supportive housing, the likes of which you saw in model one, <coughs> excuse me, or model two, is just too institutional, too supportive. People don't need those services. Um, what people need is access to housing on terms of non-discrimination. And that's what you get in model three. Um, it is affordable housing without typical barriers to entry for justice involved people. Um, it targets tenants whose primary bar barrier to getting housing is having a criminal history. Um, and the model essentially eliminates typical barriers to housing. So background checks, credit checks, residence history requirements, long look back periods. These are dispensed with in model three affordable housing. Um, the model does focus on employment services to help tenants get jobs, keep jobs, keep paying rent. Um, and as such, the admissions criteria are people with fewer service needs and with income. Um, we expect that individuals will have, you know, low to medium AMI income. Uh, there are no specific tenancy requirements for justice and all tenants, just whatever requirements exist for the building on the whole. And there's no set proportion of justice involved tenants that expected. Um, what we're thinking here is we can say to developers, it's easy. All you need to do is make room for tenants who happen to have a criminal involvement in their past, um, add in a sprinkling of job services to keep those rent checks coming in to ensure that your tenants can um, get jobs and keep jobs. Here, we imagine as possible funding streams, HPD extremely low and low income affordable fund, uh, ELA funding, um, HPD and bank loans, and some units uh, being put up for retail sale. Uh, our inspiration here is apartments set aside for the homeless in New York City in city funded housing developments. Uh, so New York City Local Law 19 of 2020 requires HPD to require developers who receive city funds to set aside 15% of units for homeless individuals and families. As of April 2020, um, due to the coronavirus pandemic, the ask is now 30% of units being set aside for the homeless as part of a request to developers to help contain the coronavirus spread. Um, now, Local Law 19 makes room for homeless people in affordable housing that was being built anyway for a more general low-income population. And Model 3 makes room for justice-involved people in affordable housing that already exists or that's being put up anyhow for a more general low-income population. Um, knowing what we know about justice involved people's barriers to getting work, we add limited job services to ensure that justice involved tenants can be successful in this housing. Um, and that wraps up our three models. I'll, I'll give the mic back to Chueta. Great. Thanks, Eleni, for walking us through our housing models. Um, and we couldn't end this presentation without expressing our gratitude to those who helped bring our project to fruition. 
We'd first like to thank Alexander Sherman Song, our Capstone Advisor, for his content support and mentorship throughout the school year. He brought his wealth of knowledge when providing feedback and guiding us along the way. We'd also like to thank Enterprise for providing constant support, resources, and referrals. Thank you so much to Judy Candy, the New York market leader for championing Enterprise's justice involved work. We'd um, also especially like to thank Tanisha Hines and Brittany Vargas for leading us throughout the school year. Brittany spoke with us multiple times to give feedback and encouragement. Brittany and Enterprise were able to connect us with the partners seen on the screen and also directed us to literature and resources that help drive our overall project. And last but not least, we are extremely grateful for the partners that we were able to interview. Without you, there would be no project. We received so much insight, knowledge, and experiences that were truly invaluable. We are so grateful to have been able to speak with you all. And with that, thank you all again for being here with us today. Um, and now we are ready to answer any of the questions that you may have. Brittany, I'll pass it off to you for any questions that enter the chat box. Thanks, Joetta. Um, thank you all again for presenting. This was an awesome presentation. I'm, I'm very, very excited about it and very happy to see it come to fruition. It's been a long, uh, a long line of work that you guys have done and I'm very, very grateful to have been part of the process and very proud of all of you guys and, and the work that you've done this year. Um, so as of right now, only one question has entered the chat box. So if any other folks have questions, please, please write them down and I'll be uh, allowing you guys to unmute yourselves as well to ask any questions. But the first question is from Emily. She says, one of my biggest issues in housing veterans is the fact that some have sex offenses, which comes with a lot of restrictions and owners and property managers won't house these individuals. So any suggestions? And this was during Sam's portion. Sam, do you wanna take it away? I, I don't have too much. It, it, sex, I mean, sex offenders came up um, limitedly. Um, but that there are specific outlines for this population, making it extra difficult. Um, I don't have too many uh, answers and that this didn't come up. Um, paying more attention and bringing this up, it's really a policy and advocacy issue. Um, and, um, but in terms of uh, what we got, we didn't, we didn't come up with too much there. And yeah, I'd like to echo, I'd like to echo that. Um, some of the policies here that are detrimental to this particular population um, include background checks and also are just general barriers that coincide with being on the sex offender registry um, and on enterprises end. Given that this is a federal policy concern, we're still, we're, we're still trying to find out how to address these types of offenses uh, when it comes to housing. And at this time, folks can unmute themselves. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, the next question, however, does come from Andrea, who says, how is Justice Involved Housing addressing the needs of formerly incarcerated women if in fact you've seen that their needs are different? Do any folks from the Capstone team have comments? Um, we took a look at our children, housing development for um, women and their families, although we didn't interview anybody at that site. Um, There's also Hope House, but Hope House was not able to continue taking on tenants in recent years. Um, so it's not something we can speak to at any, at any length, but there, there is at least one development that caters specifically to women and children. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Joetta. Um, just to echo that also um, with our research, um, we didn't see too much, but of course there are definitely major barriers for women, especially women of color. Um, and we also noticed in terms of the formerly incarcerated population entering the um, homeless shelters, it is very high. There's a higher rate for women of color, specifically black women um, in this way. So those barriers are definitely out there. And some other barriers that I'd like to add just from what we've seen in, in our partner organizations. Um, women often are looking for not only employment, 
uh, but also benefits and assistance. And then also there are many women who need support with childcare um, or reuniting with their children after, after exiting incarceration. So those are just some of the barriers um, and some of the challenges and some of the things that you have to think about when specifically targeting women in your, uh, in your housing developments. Yeah, and hi, this is Sanisha. I'll just echo that. I think one of the overarching concerns we've heard specifically to women is like the major issue is once families have, many families have been dismantled and um, women having struggles to get their children back and having to go to parenting classes, having to connect with agencies, um, think through what that reunification process actually looks like is really important, I think, when it pertains to women specifically. Um, and I think we've been thinking, I think one thing that um, I will say is that oftentimes when we talk about justice involved, you know, women historically, just especially justice involved women have been historically disenfranchised. So I think it's important, even as you talk about justice involved, to think about the woman's perspective and what that means. Um, um, oftentimes when people hear justice involved, they often are thinking about men exiting out of Rikers and men exiting out of state prisons. So even, you know, making sure language and specificity and thinking about what services and, you know, child, child care would be important and critical um, and emphasizing that as you think about um, justice involved populations and how women need to be a component within that. I just looked up our team's notes on our children um, and the distinguishing features are for women in prison, in prison programming that includes visitation services for children and families, and mentoring for children while their parents are in prison. Um, and afterwards, uh, access to childcare. So our children offers a daycare center and after school program so mothers can go to work or to school. Those might be distinguishing features of affordable housing for justice involved women and their families. Thanks, Eleni. Our next question um, is a racial equity question. So racial equity is an important outcome, but are there examples of housing providers that measure this or from, I would like to add to that question, from the conversations that you've had with providers who have said that racial, that racial equity is an important outcome and that recidivism isn't the only way to measure success, have they offered um, kind of measurements that can can prove uh, that these services and these housing projects are working for these individuals. So I can um, I can start and then please fill in where uh, I lack. But one uh, one example we saw in terms of the racial equity lens for, first from just from a mapping perspective and what we're looking at. Um, I, I, uh, one article that we've we've come across highlights the um, specifically in New York City, um, there are five zip codes in the entire city where the majority um, or a, a very large portion of inmates are coming from Brooklyn, uh, and they're they're in the they're in Brooklyn in the South Bronx. So again, communities of color, um, and that's just an important thing to note even prior to housing. And then in terms of um, housing, the racial equity lens could look a number of ways. Generally speaking, um, from what we heard, it's just, it's paying attention more disproportionately to the outcomes of black and brown people. Um, and so taking every other measure and putting a, that racial equity lens on that measure. So education as an outcome, employment as an outcome, and highlighting what are we breaking down black and brown and white and Asian uh, and, and other racial categories and are we paying attention to um, those factors and those measures so that that generally speaking is what we got uh, in our conversations. Thank you. Um, and so what if you could just go back really quickly to the housing models slide. I think some folks want to look back at it. So the next question is, what can social service providers do better to educate developers on diverse programming for justice involved persons so that they can better plan their developments to accommodate them? Uh, 
I wonder if this is a question for the developers on the call. What would it take to get you to connect with social service providers? Um, well, I'd like to give a plug to our education curriculum here. I think, uh, I think our education curriculum is going to do a really great job at kind of bridging the gap um, and really enhancing developers' knowledge of social services that are needed for this population. And, and we'll be able, you know, as Enterprise is an intermediary uh, organization, we will be able to connect folks who are, who are looking um, for those kinds of joint partnerships. Uh, the next question is, have you guys compiled a list of services during your research um, or a list of providers and, and what they provide for individuals who are justice involved that could be a useful resources or useful resource for the organizations that work with this population and for the folks on this call? In, in, is this asking like what services we we found were I guess the the most beneficial here um, I think it was just a, a question if you've compiled the the, the organizations that you've researched and, and and worked with and spoken to and have like brief summaries the so the closest thing um, in our final report we have a website um, that highlights uh, a, m a number of service providers in, in the city. Um, I believe HPD also has a website um, and we can include that in our final report. Um, and then just in terms of services themselves, we will we'll be sharing out this list of slides and our report um, that goes into the most mentioned services um, and, the, and the services that came across in our research. Um, it's not the fullest list. I don't think it covers everything, but We'll, we definitely want to share that out with everybody um, and those resources as well. I would say if you're looking for a list of the maximal amount of services that's offered by an actual organization, um, take a look at a housing program that offers wraparound services. And so Fortune Society would be an example. Um, if you look at the kinds of services that are offered at the castle or castle gardens, both in our report or on their website, you'll get a, an exhaustive list of services that are offered. Um, and then everyone else provides some, some selection of those. That's great. That's a great thing to point to, Eleni. Thanks. Um, okay, so the next question is from Kristen Miller. HUD and the city and state require both housing first practices and coordinated entry for all people who need housing. Um, so do you know how these have impacted the, the program models? So something that you guys have looked into? So I, I can speak generally about Housing First. Um, and I think Housing First is super key um, in terms of making sure that, and this relates to our recommendation around service requirements as well. When we're thinking through um, services in the past, it, this isn't as common a, a anymore, but um, especially for models around homeless housing uh, and supporting homeless populations um, prior to this work um, in, um, I believe it was like a, a stairway kind of model or a, a stair model where um, there were minimum requirements that um, individuals needed to hit in terms of uh, accessing their housing and they could be evicted if let's say um, they had specific drug counseling services that they needed to hit, but they, um, being that they maybe were addicted to a, a drug or alcohol, um, they, they weren't able to fulfill that requirement um, or they, they broke testing, something, and then they were evicted, uh, which is a huge, very, very problematic. And so we highlighted that, a number of service providers that we talked to highlighted that. Um, so that's, a, that's an area and a recommendation um, that we have that, that addresses these housing first practices and, and wants to continue those practices. I think it provides agency in the services that are being provided. And, and if we think about it, like uh, people who are addicted to drugs and other substances, they can't, you know, overturn a, 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 a drug addiction in a night. So thinking about how, how to be more lenient with services was really where um, housing first came into play in terms of like our general recommendations.
Thanks. Um, and are, are there any other folks on the, the call with some expertise on CAPS that would like to, to add anything? Um, so this is Kristen Miller. Um, uh, so I'm actually co-chair of the CAP steering committee. Um, so I think two things, um, housing first, right? So, so CAPS comes through HUD and, and the housing first is a piece of it. So that, that says that people who get, um, certain types of funding cannot do the drug testing and the program requirements and, and, and uh, participating with services as um, contingent on tenancy, right? It is completely separating those things um, so that in fact, if somebody is receiving these types of financing, they cannot uh, evict somebody for like the example that you, that you just gave for, for using drugs or something, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so for, for the coordinated entry, um, this is probably a longer conversation and I'm really happy to talk to you about it further, um, but that um, there is now a process by which people are referred into housing um, that is using primarily administrative data and the goal is to have uh, corrections data included in that. Um, so that because the demand for housing is much higher than the supply, uh, there, HUD has required that there is a, an assessment done to determine who is most vulnerable. Um, and the city, um, like 90 different uh, people representing 23 different government agencies and advocates and people with lived experience and uh, other stakeholders um, came up with how New York City is defining eligibility, um, vulnerability. So um, there's literature online. Um, if you go to the COC, New York City Continuum of Care website, there's lots of public information that's really, that lays out um, how the CAPS process works. And the reason I brought it up is because I think of um, the recommendations that you're making about admissions and seeing how that fits into the system that um, the city uh, is uh, in the midst of implementing. Thanks, Kristen. Are there any other lingering questions? Folks can unmute themselves at this point as well. Uh, Damon Rowe asks, to what extent are the coordinated entry requirements imposed on supportive housing projects funded through eShi? Damon, would you mind elaborating a little bit on that question? You can unmute yourself as well if, if that makes it easier. Hi, this is Damon. So my understanding is that the state has a much lower um, sort of um, lower restrictions in its, with respect to its coordinated entry requirements in the city. So I would just curious as to, to the extent to which those sorts of um, like the CAPS process that would be would apply through a project that's funded, for example, through 1515 would apply to a project that's not using city funding. Sorry, but yeah, I think the important thing to read, the, the biggest takeaway from CAPS is that unit eligibility supersedes everything. So as, as you guys noted, this is all very complicated and there can be many different funding sources in one building. Um, so uh, when uh, Kristen comes up as um, needing uh, housing, let's take supportive housing, and uh, apartment 4i opens up, uh, Kristen may be top of the list of most vulnerable, but may not be eligible for that particular unit, and therefore will be passed over, right? So the person going into the unit has to be eligible. So, uh, yes, for instance, 1515 and Eshai have different eligibility requirements. 
um, so that um, if, if Damon is um, not chronically homeless, he would be eligible for that unit, assuming everything else mattered, right? So that's how this kind of sorting hat is working out. It comes down to unit by unit, and it goes back to where you guys started in your presentation, which is it's all about the, the financing. D does that answer the question? I think, I, I think so. Thanks, Kristen, for, for jumping in there. Yeah. All right, we only have three minutes left. So if there are any last questions, please write them in the chat box. Otherwise, we can end three minutes early. Well, while we're all on the call, I uh, and please feel free if you have any more questions. I, I do want to just thank again the enterprise team, and I want to thank everybody, um, all the organizations, everybody who's in on this call. Um, you guys are doing critical work. Um, we are not uh, experts and uh, by any means, um, but it was really uh, a privilege to be able to work with this team, um, interview so many incredible people who are doing this job every day and especially giving COVID and what's going on in the world, we need this work even more so right now. So just want to reiterate our, our thanks to you all. And echoing Sam, um, I also want to thank you all for joining and also thank the Capstone team for their work the past year. Uh, we really think that this presentation and the report is, is definitely going to help further our Justice Involved initiative and, and we're excited to continue moving forward. Um, I do want to make an announcement here that we have recorded this lecture and, and we will be sending it out as well as um, the presentation slides. And once the report is fully complete, um, we're looking to disseminate that as well. Yes. Um, hi, this is Tanisha. I also want to jump in really quickly. I want to thank Alex and I want to thank the NYU staff team. Um, this is really, really great. I think, you know, Enterprise, I think I mentioned it when we first met, Enterprise is newer in this programmatic area and we've been building out a platform around this and convening a number of partners, many of who are on the call and have participated in these interviews. So I think just this research definitely seeds um, kind of where we're thinking about our justice involved and how enterprise can be poised to support this effort. Um, and, you know, as Sam mentioned, this work is even more critical now. So, you know, we just wanna thank you and really appreciate, you know, just, the team and Alex for being just so thoughtful about, you know, our project and, you know, making sure things are moving forward. And uh, as the professor sponsoring the project, uh, Tanisha and Brittany, you guys are amazing. Thank you. And so Thank you. <laughs> uh, hey, it's, it's Andrew. Can I say team. one quick you thing? did a great job too. So amazing. Thank you. Andrew, go ahead. Go ahead, Andrea. Oh, great. So I just, I wanted to say also our thanks to my personal thanks on behalf of NYSAFA to a lot of you at Enterprise because we had started talking before COVID took over. We had started talking about a panel on this topic that was going to be presented at the NYSAFA conference where, you know, 1200 affordable and supportive housing professionals come together and we got the conference was canceled. But so we were excited to be hearing this exact type of work in this very big set you know in that very big setting so keep your fingers crossed that that in the let's maybe say in the fall we'll be able to broadcast this to a big group and your work will fall on on a lot of really important ears so keep up the good work we didn't forget about you over at my <laughs> and we want to we want to broadcast this thank you thank so you much Andrea. Thanks. thank you Andrea. Andrea. And thanks Thank again on behalf of Enterprise um, to Brittany and Tanisha for leading this work and to the awesome student capstone team and their professor for developing this. Really kudos to everybody. Thanks. Thank you. All right. I will be ending the call. So have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.